people and friend in this industry, Mr. Joseph Barato. He's a native New Yorker and an FIT graduate. Um, he started at Brooks Brothers where he and Ralph Lauren met. Their friendship led them to the establishment of Polo and shortly after he left, after he joined uh, him, he joined Brioni as chairman, CEO, where he had a successful career and recently he rejoined Ralph Lauren as president of high fashion Italian menswear, which is the purple label. And I also wanted to mention that uh, not only is he a graduate of FIT, and you should be proud to be at FIT and stop rustling the paper. It would be nice if you listened. He uh, also won the Star Salute Award, which is given by the Alumni Association to successful graduates of this school. And, um, and that uh, Brioni is known as the Taylor of Kings, which he will briefly tell you about. And uh, I already told you that he, they met at uh, Brooks Brothers and uh, became friends, and now they're back together again, sharing their experiences and knowledge of the fashion industry at the highest level. And, uh, and ex uh, I will ask Mr. Barato to tell you about his experiences and what he attributes to success in your chosen careers. He is the best, so stay alert and learn from the uh, person that can help you. Thank you. Mr. Barato. What? Oh, yes, there's a tape, a video, a DVD that uh, Mr. Barato brought to show you. Can we start that? Oh, uh, well, here we are. Thank you, Terry, as always. like sports. I wanted to be Joe DiMaggio when I was a kid, and then I wanted to be a movie star. I never knew I was going to become a designer. I didn't even know what a designer was. Right after I got out of the Army, went to work for a company called Brooks Brothers, and then went on to work for a tie company. I watched the ties being made, and then I said, well, why don't we do this, and why don't we do that, why don't we make the tie wider? My boss at the time said, Ralph, the world isn't ready for you. So I left this company and persuaded another company to let me design ties, and I started out of a drawer in the Empire State Building. I made these ties by going to the factory and watching them made and finding fabrics all over the place. I'd take a tablecloth and make a tie out of a tablecloth. I just used anything that was in sight that I thought could be molded into a tie. I learned as I went along and work with enough professional sewers and makers of products to be able to express what I wanted to say and for them to interpret it. Polo had a sensibility that was sporty and international, and it represented the kind of clothes that I like. It was tweedy, it was sophisticated, it was stylish. A name that I believed in and a imagery that represented what the clothes were going to be like. I never wanted to be in fashion, because if you're in fashion, you're going to be out of fashion. I like things that I want. There's a certain sort of wear to them that has a sensibility to me that I like. It's like an old saddle. The utility, the things you wear to work in, the things that have a sort of honesty. So for me, dressing has always been an adventure, depending on what I'm going to do for the day and you take on the role. If you ask Ernest Hemingway what his role was, you know by looking at his clothes, he took on the role of the rugged writer, the elephant hunter. He took on that role and became the man he wanted to be. And that expression came out 
not only in his books, but in his personal style. I never loved fashion for fashion's sake. I always loved watching a character, and they inspired me. Audrey Hepburn had personal style, and she made ordinary things look great because of her own sense of style. So style has nothing to do with fashion, it has to do with the individual. I always thought that women that would wear men's clothes, they had a sexiness. Tailored clothes for women were very rare. I used to go with my wife. She would buy boys' jackets and wear tweed hacking jackets. I thought she looked great, so that was one of my inspirations. Living in New York City, traveling around the world, you feel the vibrations, and if you are tuned in, you sort of develop an ear or a feel for the clothes that you think you're going to do the next season. Fashion is about change, it's about youth, it's about aspiration, it's about what's going on in the world. It's a blend of all the things that are happening, coming from many different directions. You've got to be tuned in all the time. The way I do collections and what inspires me is a story or a theme that gets to me that says, I know how to build this. I don't build a collection from a sleeve or from a specific fabric. I build it out of a dream. Every time I design clothes, I'm making a movie. And having an inspiration where I've given all my feelings out in terms of my clothes, and I feel like I write through my clothes. Advertising is the only vehicle you can have that can take it from your mind out to the consumer. Trying to say what you want to say in a straight line is very important. I wanted to tell a story, and I think my clothes, as I design them and as I advertise them, they're about movies. I pick the star of the movie, and she or he expresses what I have to say, and they are the real stars. And I've picked models that have certain sensibilities over the years that I felt were very much the voice that I felt was in my head. If you watched a movie and saw a character wearing something, you say, I want to I be him, I want to wear that. So it wasn't the clothes per se, it was the personalities and the images that I related to. They're never about that jacket. They're about that man. They're about you, the consumer, looking at that man and wanting to have that and why you want it. Why do you want to be that guy? What is he saying to you? I design into dreams what people dream they'd like to look like, what they want to feel like, and what it says to them. And I think I've always had the pulse about how to express my sensibility to the consumer. Because I am the consumer. When I built my mansion on Madison Avenue, I was taking you into a world. It wasn't just a store. I was taking you into a home. I was giving you all the mood and the atmosphere. To me, that's exciting. I always felt retail was the answer to our business because as much as a merchant loves what you do, they're not the same team. I have a team that really gets it. When you design the clothes, you have a vision. You know exactly what you want to say. If you don't watch that and carry it through, what you want to say doesn't always happen. We're all over the world, and we have to make sure that our statement gets, gets across. What happens when you have your own retail is you carry your message right to the consumer. It's as if I'm speaking right to the consumer. And that's the best thing you can possibly do. Understanding the consumer, understanding where you are, how to get them to understand your message. That's the business of being global. When I started out, 
It did ties, it went from ties to shirts, to sweaters, to jackets, to men's, to women's, to home, to retail stores, to advertising, now to the internet. Today, it is the largest store we have, and it's spreading the brand and showing the brand in a way that you could never show it in advertising. You can show your whole company visually on the internet. The internet is where I can express not only my designs, but my thoughts. It makes my role much more intimate with the consumer. What makes this company interesting is that we are making profits. We are doing the right fashion. We are on Wall Street as one of the most admired companies today. I'm very proud of where we are. I feel we have a great company. I'm here because I love what I do. I love this company. And I am faced with a lot of issues. We're a public company. We have to perform. The success of this company has been we have been focused on a consumer, that we know who we are. We know how to advertise, we know how to develop product, and we've done that well. I've always vowed that I would do what I believed in and try to just keep creating and doing it with as much integrity as I possibly can. And today I'm wearing a Pink Pony shirt by Polo Ralph Lauren, and a, pro a portion of the proceeds from Pink Pony Productions help support cancer care and prevention. As a company that is successful, Maybe there are things we can do to help others. And I think it is a very important thing to do. I think it sets an example for the rest of the world, the rest of the business community, and part of the heritage of what I would love this company to stand for. Not only beautiful products, not only good taste, but a company that, that thinks of the world and tries to do something that it can do. Polo is like a school. People that come to the school, they learn. Some graduate and leave, and some stay forever. I try to make the environment really comfortable because I am comfortable with a happy environment, and I like people. This is a big company. It's an, an international company that has the right people in the right places to make the flow work, whether it be financial or whether it be retail leaders or whether it be administrative leaders. It is a mix of talent. It's a mix of very good people that have joined together. And this is an army. It's an army of talent. And I would say that I'm the general. And the reason this company has grown is because of the talents that attract other talent. And you can't have anything if, if you haven't built a team. And I think one of the things that I feel most proud is that I built a team. I took it from myself into a, into a cast of thousands. I didn't go to fashion school, so what, what did I have? I had a passion and, and something that I felt I had inside me, and I was able to express it. I enjoy the work. I enjoy building the company, and I enjoy working with people. It's really amazing for me to look at you and see all the people that are in this company. I have a wonderful family at home, but I have a family here. My name is on the label, but it's all of us together that make this company. And I thank you very much. afternoon. How did you enjoy that? Pretty amazing, isn't it? Professor Alice, thank you for having me here again. I appreciate I think this is my 14th year, so I must be doing something right. Um, that's Ralph. 
Let me shut this off. I'm going to give my age away and maybe Ralph's too, but he just celebrated his 40th year in business. And about 44 years ago is when I met him at a uh, storage store called Brooks Brothers. He was a salesman and I was the assistant buyer in those days. And he had a message then, a vision then. And um, I, I, when I look at this, I just can't believe what he's accomplished in those 44 years since I first met him. And I, I think some of the reasons that he, he accomplished these things is basically where it all started for me, maybe where it started for him. And it was obviously something that triggered his, his love and passion for what he's finally been able to do. Mine started with the movies, and he kind of alluded to that. That was my first sense of wanting to be in the fashion business. I didn't really understand why, but it was the movies that excited me. Um, and I still watch the uh, Turner Broadcast uh, channel, and I still get the same uh, feeling that I, I get when I was a kid. So for me, it, it started way back then, and I did go to school, a fashion school. Ralph didn't. I went to FIT. And I, I hate to admit to you that uh, maybe there was as many students as we, are, we have in this room today that went to that school way back then. But anyway, FIT certainly helped me develop my personality um, a long time ago. And I am forever grateful for what it, it taught me in those days. Basically, what I learned from FIT was integrity. Um, the school gave me a certain sense of that, and I've followed it my entire career. And it has done nothing but great things for me. It taught me about quality. The better st the student I was, the more industrious I was, the harder I worked, the better I positioned myself in the industry in top positions. It taught me passion. Um, there were some great, great teachers here that really taught me their passion for what they were doing. And that still continues today, a vision. And as, as I say these words, I'd like you to think about each word that I'm saying and kind of pull Ralph into this a little bit, pull yourselves into it a little bit. And these are all the qualities that kind of rounded me off. And um, being a recipient of the um, award, the, I forgot the, the Star Salute Award, um, this guy that was sitting in your position 40 years ago now is standing here talking to you about his career and his contribution and being recognized by the school I went to. It's very humiliating for me and, and as, I, as I mentioned, listen to some of the words that I'm trying to project here for you that always was my direction. Inspiration. Um, I've always been inspired by things. Uh, Ralph said it in the um, clip. He said, you always find ideas just by looking, being alert. And um, that's something that I always uh, acknowledge. I, I'm not a designer. Uh, I'm a merchant, but um, I'll tell you a funny story. In my last company, um, I was going through a, a collection of uh, vintage um, swatches. And in that group of uh, vintage swatches were some wallpaper patterns. And I said, well, what's that? He says, well, it got here by accident. I'm sorry. I said, no, wait a minute. Wait a minute. L let me see that. And there was one particular wallpaper pattern that was very vintage and very beautiful. I said, I want that. And you, in those days, I think you paid like $50 for the swatch or the clip. And I paid $50. I went to um, Italy. I went to a mill. And I created the most beautiful suit. It was our best-selling suit that season. And that's only because I was alert and aware. And every time I look out here, I see something that excites me and makes me think, constantly think. So inspiration is a very important part of um, my career. 
respect. Um, Professor Alice alluded to that before. Um, boy, that's the easiest thing to do. Respect yourself, you respect your, your peers. It always works. I never had a problem with that. Um, and I guess the last thing I want to say is that you follow your dreams. You always put your dream out there and make it your reality. Here's a guy uh, 44 years ago that had a dream, a product of uh, Manhattan, the Bronx, as I am, New York City. I'm not quite the billionaire he is, but I think I've, I've done okay with my career. And, and basically, what, what, he, um, what he always wanted to do was follow his dream. And he never wavered from his point of view. I've never wavered from some of the buzzwords I said, integrity, quality, passion, vision. You don't waver. You follow the path. You remain consistent. And I think that's very, very important. So early on, um, FIT taught me some basic fundamentals that I followed throughout my career. And, um, and, 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 and you know, it was, it was really very, very exciting. Um, another thing that I've learned over the years was having self-confidence. Um, about a year and a half ago, um, it was reported that I was going to become a uh, consultant and I was going to retire. And uh, Mr. Loring got wind of that and called me. He said, what's this I hear you're retiring? I said, well, not quite. I'm not quite retiring. I'm going to be consulting. He says, no, you're not. You're coming back here. He said, I want you here. You belong here. And you have to retire here. So after being employee number three 40 years ago, I became employee number 22,000. And what I've learned over that period of 40 years that the company, it's bigger, of course, but the spirit never changed. Ralph's spirit still prevails. His love, his passion still prevails. His, he's still dreaming. I'm in, involved in design meetings with Ralph, and he still has the dream. And it's, after 44 years, still very, very exciting for me. So when you have the passion, you never lose the excitement. Um, you know, passion. Is, is a very unique thing. There are many things in life that will catch your eye, but only a few will catch your heart. Pursue those. Um, it may be an overused word, but you know when someone has passion for whatever they do, regardless, you get the feel of that immediately. And that passion equals confidence. It gives you a great deal of confidence. One of the things that I've done in the last year is visit all of Ralph Lauren's stores, retail stores. And basically, I've become a lecturer, like I'm doing here today. And people say, my God, you're, you are amazing. You really inspired me. You motivated me. And I say to myself, what did I do? All I'm trying to express is what I love. Some people say that I have a job. I don't think I worked a day in my life. I love so much what I do that I don't call it work. I call it my passion. It's my dream come true. And Ralph was on the same wavelength way back then that he is today. And that was, that's what still inspires him. So re remember, remember the word passion. It's a very, very, very important part of your makeup. And you some days will become leaders of the industry. Um, I know that. This is a great school. You're being taught by some great teachers. And you have the ability to someday be standing here lecturing, although 40 years ago when I went to the school, I never would have thought that. It's my God, never, ever. I was just hoping to make a little living for myself and, and be happy. But um, thank God I, I, I had the confidence and, and, and the alertness and the initiative to kind of follow my dream. And, and here I am today. Um, Ralph alluded to family before. Um, one of the things in business 
that you must understand is teamwork. It's being used a lot today. Uh, but, you know, you, you, when you work with a great team, you learn every day. I'll give you an example. I joined this company, again, rejoined it a year and a half ago, and a lot changed except for what I mentioned, the spirit. And I was surrounded by all these young people, just about your age in, in, in this uh, auditorium. And all of a sudden, I was getting a whole different perspective. For the last 20 years, I was CEO of a company, a pretty successful company, and I was the guy that obviously made all the decisions and was involved in everything that was going on with the company. When I moved to the world of Ralph Lauren, it was a little different. It was more obviously corporate, more a real corporate culture, and there was a lot of things that I had to wave it through that I didn't quite understand. It was very challenging. So little by little, I learned the different steps because that's what you have to do. It's called adapting. I didn't have to adapt at this point in my life, but it was a challenge, and I learned. I'm learning every day. It's amazing. But <clears throat> one of the things that – I thought there was water here. Oh, here it is. Excuse me one second. One of the things I learned from young people, there were – bunch of young guys running around the office wearing suits and they, they it looked like the most ill-fitting suits I've ever seen on anybody and I said come over here let, let me teach you how to wear a suit so now I'm going back to my beginnings 40 years ago excuse me and I try to teach these young men how to wear a suit and they were very respectful, they said thank you, and I didn't turn my head but more than a minute, and they're back to what I thought was an ill-fitting size. Usually they wear a suit a size smaller, like it's hugging them. And I didn't quite understand, but then I realized, I'm looking at this auditorium today, I think, who isn't wearing jeans? Maybe that would be an easier way to, to project what I'm trying to, to make you understand. These guys wanted their jackets to fit like a pair of jeans. And that makes a lot of sense to me. It makes a lot of sense to me. Young people were teaching me a different method, and I understood. I got it. Now, when I feel like I want to be sexy and a little younger, I wear a suit one size smaller just to give me that spirit. So, you know, you, you learn all the time. But on the other hand, you have to understand how, how I was raised in this industry. Uh, you talk about respect. It was, I don't know, before I worked, I joined Ralph maybe 42 years ago. I can't remember exactly, but I was married and due to have my first child, and I was giving, uh, given a territory. This was after my Brooks Brothers days, after I finished at FIT. In fact, Ralph was doing the same thing I was doing. He was selling ties. I was selling pants. And I went to a store in New Jersey called Bragg and & Son. And um, I calculated the night before that if I can maintain the order, I'll make about $15 in commission. There's a lot of money in those days. But being a little more aggressive, and industrious, I said, I'm going to increase at 10%. So I'll make an extra dollar fifty, And that meant a lot. So I went in there, and I was all excited. I walked into the store. I'm looking for Mr. Bragg. So Mr. Bragg comes out. And he looks at me. He says, yes, young man. I said, I represent Corbin Trousers, and um, I'm here to sell you. Oh, OK. Uh, come with me. So I have my little case, walk follow him, I thought I was going to go into the selling room. He takes me to a wall full of hats, men's hats, and he looked at me and says, pick a hat. And I'm looking at him, I said, what's going on here? I'm here to sell pants, he's bringing me to a wall of hats. And he said to me, pick a hat, I picked a hat, put it on, you like it? Yes. He said, all right, young man, he said, I'm not going to charge you full price, I'm charging you $8 for that hat. It was normally 15, a lot of money in those days. And then he looked at me and he pointed to me and he says, young man, 
don't you ever come into the store not representing your industry. Now, the hat was part of the uniform. JFK, does anybody know who that is, John, John Fitzgerald Kennedy? Good. <laughs> he was president, and if you all know, at his inaugural, he did not wear a hat, and he started a trend, and that trend literally destroyed the hat business in America. So I was a hip young guy, and I wanted to emulate Mr. Uh, president Kennedy, and I walked in without a hat. And this guy corrected me immediately. And I never, never forgot that message. Because we have to represent, really, truly represent, we're the image of what we represent to the public. And in the fashion business, this is what we have to reflect. You can't ever forget that. You're a very important part of your, your industry. And you are what you are you, when you wear your clothes. I mean, I'd love to be here with a pair of jeans and a cool shirt without a tie. I mean, I do that on weekends. But when I come here, if you recall what Ralph's saying, role model, every day he has an idea of who he wants to be and why. I come here today with the purpose, and I'm dressed for that reason, that purpose. Tomorrow, I'm in design meetings with Ralph. I'll be more casual maybe a little more creative than this. But always, ref always reflect on who you are and how you represent your industry. It's very, very important. When I got the FIT Alumni Star uh, or Salute Award, it was at the uh, United Nations. It was a black tie evening. And um, it was just one of the most amazing, amazing um, nights of my, my life, my career. And what I've learned about that night was the, the quality aspect of it. Everything was so beautiful. The company I represented was the, the ultimate menswear and women's wear company in the world, all handmade things. And I, I, I realized that quality is never an accident. You know, everybody talks about the luxury business today. What makes the luxury business? A lot of integrity. You can't cheat when you're in a luxury business. You gotta present the best product. And quality, it's always the result of high intention, sincere effort, intelligent direction, and skillful execution. It re represents the wise choice of many alternatives. Now, I'm not just talking about luxury brands. I'm talking about your life in general. Quality, being a quality person. It's very, very important, and the message gets very clearly associated with you. Um, I, I hope I'm clear. I'm kind of going all over the place, but I just want you to understand that there is no achievement without a goal. Um, when I was a student at FIT, as I keep repeating, I never thought I'd be here, but here I am. Was it a goal? Maybe. Maybe in my dreams, I thought someday I could teach here. Well, now I lecture here. So I never let my vision be curtailed. I let it expand. My dream is expand as much as I can. My quest was, be to, was to be the best I could be in this industry. And I'm very, very fortunate to have been side by side with some amazing icons, Stanley Marcus, uh, people who I respected, Ralph Lauren. And to think that I'm kind of considered in the industry um, someone like that. So learning and growing is a lesson that all things are difficult before they become easy. Look for the opportunities, work hard, Keep the passion, keep your integrity, and pay attention to the details in life. That's very, very, very important. Um, I was born and raised in Manhattan from a uh, middle-class family, not too far from here, 19th Street and 3rd Avenue. As I said, I was a student at FIT, and um, you know, I've, I've really come a long way. And when I think about my career, I think about the people I've met that helped me 
develop the person I am today. I think about a story, a simple story, like one year with Brioni, when I was running Brioni, we did an amazing um, advertising campaign. And a, a famous movie producer who just recently passed away, I see him clearly, but I just forgot his name, I'm sorry, saw that ad and he said to his costume designer, I want Dr. T to look just like that. So she called me and she said, introduced herself over the phone, said, may I sit down and talk to you about a potential movie? And I said, well, sure. So she came up and she said, the movie is Dr. T and his woman, and the main actor is Richard Gere. So she said, would you be interested? I said, yeah, of course. And she said, we want Richard to look just like Dr. T, uh, like uh, the ads that you just projected for Dr. T, so that he could, Dr. T could look like the ads you projected. So Richard Gere comes up, <clears throat> was scheduled to come up for about 15 minutes. Now all the women in the office were going crazy. They were just running around and like, wow, all this excitement. And unfortunately, I didn't have the same passion. I mean, he's a nice guy, but I, we, had a, we had business to do. So he sits down and he says to me, who's Brioni? I started talking, but he was getting impatient, so he gets up, he goes to the rack, he starts feeling things. I said, what's this? I said, that's a cashmere sport coat. Cashmere sport coat, wow. He never owned a cashmere sport coat. And I explained to him, our product is touch. When you touch it, you feel something beautiful. He says, great, great. Well, anyway, three and a half hours later, he left. We connected like you would not believe. Richard Gere and Joe Barato. And, you know, I used to call my parents up and tell them, I met Richard Gere today and we connected. It was not, and my mother's all excited. My father can't believe it. I'm not so impressed. He's a nice guy. So to make a long story short, this is where respect comes in. This is why I'm telling you the story. He didn't know anything about our industry. So I was basically the director that day. So he put his shirt and tie on and he said, how's it look? I said, Richard, it looks great, but let me do one thing. So I put a dimple in his tie. He never understood what a dimple was. So he's looking in the mirror, he says, do you like this? I said, yeah. He had his assistant take the picture of the dimple in a tie. Well, four months later, the movie comes out. The first scene, he's wearing a shirt and tie. Bingo, there's the dimple. Well, you can't imagine how that made me feel. Because whenever I got involved with the movie industry, um, it, it was always exciting. <clears throat> but when they respect your profession and fo follow your lead and almost become loyal and cooperate with your point of view, it's just so nice. And when you look at a clip like this, you think about Ralph the actor Ralph the director, Ralph the producer, Ralph the creator. Well, everybody can be Ralph doing that. Everybody. And I wish you his fortune, obviously, but everybody can do that. So, um, again, I, I, I'm thrilled to be here. Um, I've had a, a very, very exciting career. I've met a lot of people along the way. And I only wish the, the same for you. Um, it's, it's always an honor to be here. Thank you again for having me. And now, this is the best part for me at least, is the questions and answers. So please challenge me with great, great, great questions. Yes, ma'am. Well, the first thing I would say is that he has an amazing passion for what he does. He has amazing vision. Obviously, a tremendous creativity. He's always, always searching, always searching. He has never wavered in his point of view. He's been consistent. 
consistent. And I think one of the things that is really uh, is underrated and doesn't get out enough is he's a great teacher. He's a great, great teacher. He has put together a wonderful team of people and he teaches every step of the way. In design meetings, he still teaches me. I don't know if I left anything out. Sorry, what was your major when you were at FLB? I don't think we had majors then. I was just like occupying space. <laughs> no, I was doing a little bit of everything. I, my major, I think, I believe it or not, was business, if I'm not mistaken. I, I, I forgot how it worked in those days. Yeah, that's, I, I think that's what they call it. It was relatively new and I was I probably business slash fashion merchandising. I, I never went to fashion classes. You know, they had classes where you cut patterns and things like that. I was more into the merchandising aspect of it. So that's why I say business merchandising. Uh, because that's what I am. I'm a merchant. I don't pretend to be a designer. I don't sketch. I don't do anything thing like that, but I can, I can recognize how to be a merchant. And that's very, very important. It's a very, um, I'm told, a unique talent. I do it naturally. God gave me the talent. And it's very easy for me. Ralph Lauren put me in charge of two businesses that have been relatively, um, well, they have not been too successful. And in a year and a half that I've been there, I've been able to turn it around. And I use all of my, not to say that he's not a great designer, but what his message wasn't being expressed. And I understood that. And I took his message and made a statement with it. And that's basically why we're successful today. That makes sense to you? So you mean he had great design, but somehow you weren't marketing properly about how you should it, Marketing, uh, actually merchandising it properly. Had a great design team. But what he was not bringing, it was a lot of breadth with uh, a breadth of selection. But it was like way out here. What I did was bring it in, confine it, and make a statement, a cohesive statement, so that it was easy for the retailers to read and see. Rather than confuse them, I made it clear for them. And sometimes designers, you know, they, he's got so much going on that he could be all over the place, and that's his prerogative. It's our, it's our job to pull it all in and make it work. Yes. Purple Label is probably his, own, his most personal statement today. It represents his luxury world. It's all about luxury with an accent on what he calls Salvo Road, bespoke tailoring. Everything is handmade. Everything is made in Italy. And I might also mention that I'm also president of his black label division, which is also um, a little more European, a little more edgy, a lot more sexy, <laughs> and geared to a younger market with, with the Ralph Lauren sensibilities. So here again, Ralph is role playing. He understands that he needs his purple label for his anchor, his luxury. Then he's saying to himself, gee, but there's a young guy out there who wears clothing today without rules. He'll wear a suit jacket with a pair of jeans, T-shirt. That's not Purple Label, but I want that guy. I want him in my world, my way. So he created Black Label. Well, more Purple and Black are more limited distribution. It's not in Macy's. It's not in the more commercial stores. It's more in, in like the Bergdorf Goodmans and the Saxes and stores like that. Yes. What do I do? Nothing. <laughs> what do I do? I'm, right now, I'm more in a role of teaching, by example, um, administrating, merchandising, and inspiring. Um, the company has really not had um, that person to do that kind of thing for Purple and Black Label. And I'm involved in design. I'm not a designer, but I participate, express my ideas. 
I, I told Ralph in one of the design meetings that, and I'm not a designer, I said, you know, we have to make something in a purple label line that uh, I think is very necessary. He said, well, I don't believe in that. I said, but we can sell it because it really has the integrity of what you represent in purple label. He said, okay. And we sold about 1,200 units. Um, without compromising his point of view, it was just something that I know we needed to have because I'm out there all the time seeing and hearing what people are telling me that they need. This absolutely worked into that profile. He said, okay, and the results were amazing. So that's, does that kind of answer your question? I do a little bit of everything. And I try to teach young guys how to dress properly. Yes? understand what I'm going to say because I learned it at a very young age. I, I'm working with a lot of young people and I can tell you the ones that are going to be successful and I can tell you why. Think about this for a minute. There's a very, very fine line and I call it mediocrity and I've learned about being one step above the line, being on a level above mediocrity is what makes you so unique. If you stay at the line or below, it's not going to happen. And if, if that can instill you any way, I, I hope it does. I hope you remember that like I remembered when I was a very young person. I forgot who told me that, but it was, a, it was like a slap in the face. You all follow that? The world is full of mediocrity. The world is full of mediocrity. That's easy to come by. But think about the people who are successful, just one step above it. Not a giant leap, but a little step above to make yourself special. And that's all you have to do. And I hope that makes sense. And it's easy. It's easy. Does that? Well, yeah, I, I beg to differ with you. Joe Abood, do you know the name? Joseph Abood, the designer. Does there, anybody know who that is? He sold his business for $90 million. He's one of those persons you just described. He worked in that, that office with Ralph for 22,000 people. Tom Brown, anybody know that name? He was working with Ralph. There are a roster. I can't mention them all because it'll take too much time of people who work for Ralph Lauren that set their own direction and have their own careers. And a lot of them are designers. Uh, Calvin Klein had some amazing people graduate from that school. Vera Wang, does anybody know Vera Wang? Worked in that same office you just described with Ralph Lauren. And why? Because they were all very special. They were all very special. So you can't take that attitude I mean, I started off as a, um, as a uh, stock boy at Brooks Brothers, a stock boy. You know what they used to make me do? They initiated me with a pail. They would say to me, young man, take this pail up to the eighth floor, I was on a fourth, and bring it down filled with steam <laughs> without a lid on it. And I, I never challenged them. I was so intimidated that I ran up. They were waiting for me. They put the steam in. I ran down. I left the pail there. You think I was thinking about where I am today, running up and down with a pail full of steam? 
I mean, and at Brooks Brothers, I became the, the youngest assistant to the buyer in the history of Brooks Brothers. Because I said, I'm not going to be carrying pails of steam up and down. Yes? Person, you mean? No, your personal movies. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Um, yeah. <laughs> oh, God. You know what happens when you get old? They're called senior moments. <laughs> Help me, Audrey Hepburn. Uh, no, no. It hum Humphrey Bogart. She's in a tree. Sabrina. Sabrina. Sabrina, thank you. I think that's one of my favorites. And um, I would have to say every Fred Astaire movie, particularly the one with uh, Irene Dunn, I think her name was, where they do, I, I believe, I have it on my iPod. By the way, I have an iPod with 4,500 songs. And I have this scene, they say it was the best dance scene ever. And you talk about flair and imagination and creativity and passion. Fred Astaire was what he was because of his passion. And he happened to have been a great dresser. Yes, I was thinking. Yeah, so I would say that's probably some of the movies that inspired me. Yes. He was what? Oh, not at all. Yeah. Why don't you send me your resume, and I will refer it uh, to human resources. They're always looking, obviously, for young, talented people. And that goes for any of you, if you think that's a path you'd like to consider. I can't guarantee anything, but I can guarantee an opportunity to meet with the people. Then it's up to you. Well, I work for Ralph Lauren now. You should have seen me when I represented Brioni. I spoke with an accent. Brioni is Roman, but like many of the Italian companies, Mr. Parada founded Brioni USA. Yeah, I was the CEO of USA. Yeah. Yeah, no, no, I... Do they, do they now, you, today with European companies, they have merchandisers, you know, giving input from the American market, but it's mostly design teams from, from Europe. But we, I did a lot of the merchandising with my merchandiser for Brioni. Uh, my son runs it now, and um, I used to use a lot of a lot of interns from FIT. So if you're interested, I could refer you to my son as an intern. Yes? Hi, my name is Ian. What the You know, that's a good question. I, I think a lot of it is, is, is instinct. Um, you know, when you're married, you're in a partnership, and you kind of anticipate each other's needs, hopefully. And anticipation, I think, is a very important word. Now, when Ralph does something, I can anticipate what he's trying to do. And then when he does it, confirms to me what he's doing, and then I take it to the next step. For example, for spring 08, he did very bespoke suits with outrageous, outrageous furnishings, the shirt and the tie combination. It was very exciting. It was very unexpected. It was his mood right then. Is it commercially successful? No. Is it a statement? Yes. 
So I took that statement without hurting what Ralph was trying to say and made a commercial. By that I mean I put the whole concept together that way and that I balanced it with core things that will sell to balance the outrageous things that are needed. It was his, his runway statement. But that doesn't sell like basic things. So what I'm trying to say is that if you remember what he said, you know, he doesn't want to be in a fashion business. He wants to make statements, but the core business is very important. The white shirt, the tie, solid tie, whatever it may be. You know what I'm saying? You gotta, you, gotta, you gotta understand how to balance it. And by balancing it, you give it its commercial reason to sell. That makes sense to you? Yes. You know, it, it's a very good question, and I'm sure Ralph wrestles with this probably every day of his life. But Ralph loves challenges. And what made Ralph Lauren innovative and reached the point where he became a public company is the reason why he survives. The stock has been stellar, except recently with the housing market, um, all retail stocks probably lost 30, 35% value because the market is anticipating with the housing problem that it's gonna impact retail. So, but un until that moment, the stock has been stellar, and growing, growing, and growing. And I think that inspires Ralph because he's so competitive that he wants to be the best company on a stock market. He's driven, he's driven. So yeah, you've got to make money, and getting back to my, my answer to her, you've got to balance it, the core with the, with the, with the excitement. And it's got to be 80-20, core to excitement. But in his company, to keep that innovative thing going, he's got like 20 design, designers to one salesperson. He puts a lot of emphasis on design. You have a team of young people going out on a tour around the country and their whole objective is to go to vintage stores and collect things. What a great job that is, huh? He does it in jewelry, he does it in clothing, and not to say that he knocks it off, but he's inspired, he takes something, this is brilliance, and just interprets it a little in his own, in his own style. So I would say that there's a lot of room for creativity, in fact, more public companies should be creative than they are. No, never, ever. Never, ever. Never, ever. He likes control. And he's the biggest shareholder, as you know. Great questions. I'm really appreciating your, your um, contribution. Any other questions? Yes. You know, it's not like he hires them, but but they stand out. You you can recognize them. He's got some really, really great young people surrounding him with great, great, great um, design ideas. Um, you know, he makes the final decisions obviously, as every designer does. But he has a great network of young people. And, you know, it, it's, it's what you feel about yourself and the way you express it and the way you dress. And he'll, he'll pick up on that. He'll, he'll see a young person walking. Boy, he said, I love the way you put yourself together. And he understands that. And people in that company are all very individual. They really are. 
uh, and they bring a lot to the table. I, I'm, I'm overwhelmed by the talent in that company. Talent finds talent. Yeah, having five children. Because they're the ones that drove me above the line of mediocrity. I had to feed five mouths. Um, no, I mean, I, I, that mediocrity story, school, meeting some great people, meeting some not great people, taking the good from the good and leaving the bad with the bad. That's, that, that's, those are the highlights of my career. And, and, and being very fortunate to love what I do, and like I said before, I, I don't feel like I work. I, I love getting up in the morning and working, and I've been doing that for 44 years. I love it. I walk into a Ralph Lauren store today, and I still get excited. And as long as I have that emotion and passion, the only problem is I gotta hide the stuff I bring home because my wife has it fit and I have no room in my closet. <laughs> so I sneak it in, I smuggle it in. <laughs> yes? In my career, just looking for the opportunities and being in the right position, you know, at the right time. I mean, I really planned my career, as I said before, I made a path. Um, at one point, I was a, um, Vice President at Bergdorf Goodman, which was one, uh, one store, and then I had a store on my planes in those days. And the hot store in Manhattan, or in the, in, in the entire industry, was Bloomingdale's. That was the hot store. And they came after me to go to work for them. And it scared me. From one store to a multiple of about 14 stores. And I said to myself, if I make my a decision to work for Bloomingdale's, I will destroy myself. I said, I'm not ready. And I gave up an amazing salary, I think a, an amazing opportunity, because I, I had the confidence to make the decision, but to also know I wasn't ready. So I sat back, and I got a, another great job. And that was only four stores. I moved to Washington, D.C., and um, that, excuse me, that I could control. And that was part of my thinking, my process, because if I fail that young, it may not have been good for my career. And by the way, one thing I didn't tell you, um, and maybe to answer your question, um, I left Ralph Lauren reluctantly uh, because I had two kids at the time. And every time I went to him for a raise, he would say to me, but you're my friend. How can you ask me for a raise? And I said, Ralph, I said, you know, I've got a family to feed. And he says, well, just be patient. So I decided to leave Ralph and go into my own business. And I, whatever I, I, I had in my savings account, I put into that business. And guess what? Lost it. Had two stores, lost the two stores, lost my savings. Um, and it was, the, it was a hard lesson, but it was probably the greatest lesson of my career because I got more aggressive after that. I said, you know, I, I didn't make a mistake, it was circumstances. It was, you, you kids don't know this, but there was something called the Yom Kippur War, and it was the first gas crisis we ever had in this country. And it was a disaster. The market crashed, everything happened at the wrong time for me. And then I was a little smart guy, and I decided to open a second store when I could barely finance my first store. So it all became a, a succession of negative moves and it cost me my life savings and my business. But I rebounded and it was a good lesson and I never looked back. Yes? No, I, I think that it's a mix. Um, um, there's a, there's a gal um, near my office who designs knitwear for little girls. I have five granddaughters. So I'm always in her office trying to get some free sweaters. And she's German. 
She's from Germany, very talented. Um, and I'm sure there, uh, there's a guy by the name of Maurizio, who's a genius in the jeans business. Um, he runs the double RL division. So I would say there's Europeans, there's Asians. I mean, it, it's like the UN there. Ralph is not just looking for American. Just talent. Any other questions? Well, thank you so much. I That's great. Um, that's great. I can see that. I, I can see that by the questions. I really appreciate I've been doing this for 14 years, as I said before, and I'm very, very um, inspired by your questions and your, um, and your, your attention. Thank you very much.